Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ross Cattell, the president of Bryant University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the first in our fall panel series. The panel series is Paths to Recovery, Strategies for Getting Back to Work and to a Better Future. Our nation and the economy have been dealing with dynamic challenges presented by the global pandemic. We just hit the six month mark of this global pandemic. The historical impact of this public health crisis has hit every sector and touched every family. In this context, we wanna focus on a way forward towards a stronger and better future. Over the course of this series, Paths to Recovery, we will explore four very important topics. Today, we will talk about healthcare during the pandemic. That will be followed by a panel discussion on restoring the social fabric. And then we'll have a session, a panel discussion with experts on FinTech and the future of finance and banking. And then towards the end of the semester, we'll have our final panel where we'll talk about the challenges after the presidential election with a focus on the economic and fiscal and financial challenges looking forward for this country, for this state, and for our students and the state of Rhode Island. We are grateful for the continued partnership of Neil Steinberg and the Rhode Island Foundation, which worked with Bryant on the successful pandemic economic series this spring. We are also very grateful for the sponsorship support of Citizens Bank and Fidelity Investments. Now, let me introduce our moderator, the director of the Bryant University Center for Health and Behavioral Sciences and professor and chair for the Department of Science and Technology, Kirsten Hopeness. I hope that everyone enjoys today's discussion and the insights of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, President Gattel, and welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. We're truly delighted to have such a large crowd um, listening to this great topic today. It includes not only our great President Ross Gattel, but also Provost Somacy, a number of different vice presidents, deans, faculty, staff, students, alumni, and members of our local community. So we're really excited to be able to bring this event to you. And it's with your support and your enthusiasm that makes this, this event not only meaningful, but also very um, powerful. Um, so it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. It's something that's very near and dear to my heart, talking about healthcare and particularly healthcare in the pandemic times. Um, and so this is the first in a series of a number of different fall virtual panels that were started by Eddie Tabaldi and the pandemic economic panel. So it's a continuation of something that we did this past spring. So this dynamic discussion we hope will highlight the need for collaboration and interdisciplinary nature of the healthcare sector. Um, so I'm fortunate to be joined by a really distinctive members of the healthcare community that all represent very different aspects of this, this very nature of healthcare. Um, and so we hope that this, this panel will not only highlight, again, the collaboration between all of these different sectors, but also the fact that the pandemic has highlighted some of the fragility that exists within our system. So just to tell you a little bit about how today is going to go, I'm going to start with a brief introduction of our panelists, um, followed by what we hope to be a very rich discussion. Um, at the end of the program, there'll be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. And so members of the audience can actually put their questions and submit them into the chat box. And members of our community will be sort of going through those questions and feeding them to us so that we can make sure that we address some of your questions and concerns about healthcare in the pandemic times as well. Um, and so we have a lot of students today. I know some students have already submitted their questions to me in advance. So we look forward to answering some of those student questions as well. So now I'm delighted and I have the honor and privilege to introduce to you our panelists. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Danusha Dietrich. She's a board certified pediatrician and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She's a clinical assistant professor of pediatrics at Brown Medical School and at Bryant's Physician Assistant Program. She has served on the Vaccine Advisory Board at the Rhode Island Department of Health and currently serves on the Infection Prevention Committee at Women and Infants. 
She received her MD from Tufts University School of Medicine and completed her pediatric residency training and fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at Hasbro Children's Hospital in Brown University. Next, we have Jay Amrion, who is the founding director of the PA program at Bryant University. He continues his clinical work as a PA at the MGH Chelsea Health Center and leads a weekly student clinic at the Rhode Island Free Clinic. Amrian previously served as a PA and was an officer in the US Coast Guard for more than 22 years. He serves on the board of the Rhode Island Academy of Physician Assistants and the American Heart Association. And he is a lifetime member of the Veterans Caucus of the American Academy of Physician Assistants. He earned his BS and his MPAS from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Next, we have Jennifer, or sorry, Major Jennifer Coleman. She just got promoted, so congratulations to her. Um, she's a clinical psychologist and flight commander for the Behavioral Anal Analysis Service at the Joint Military Base, San Antonio, Lackland. She has had a variety of leadership positions, including alcohol and drug abuse prevention and treatment program manager and mental health flight commander. Her clinical experiences include working with adults with a wide range, wide range of difficulties, including co-occurring substance use disorders and PTSD. She earned her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, and is one of our proud Bryant alumni um, BS in psychology. Um, finally, we have Dr. Andre Zerar, who is the founder and president and CEO of Greenlight Biosciences. It's a company that's focused on solving some of the world's greatest challenges in human health, animal health, and food production through the use of ribonucleic acid, otherwise known as RNA. Greenlight Biosciences is currently developing and expanding vaccine efforts to establish a scalable manufacturing platform and is advancing RNA-based vaccines and therapeutics against COVID-19. Zurer has contributed to the development of a number of breakthrough, life-saving therapies in human health, including oncology, autoimmune diseases, genetic disorders, and infectious diseases. Dr. Zurer completed his undergraduate studies at the National University of Mexico and received doctoral degrees from MIT and from Harvard Medical School. Also proud parents of a freshman bio major, Antonio, so we're super proud to have you here as well. So as you can see, we have a really fantastic panel and I wanna to get to their questions um, in just a moment. Um, as a trained immunologist and virologist, I just wanted to say that this is again, something that's very passionate to me. Um, I think that sometimes as a scientist and as a lab scientist, um, sometimes you question what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, I spent many years of my life working with mice um, and looking at sort of the, the immune responses to viral infections. And sometimes you sort of get in the weeds in terms of science and, and not understanding sort of the broader picture. And so I think something that this pandemic has highlighted, which is very important, is the, the importance of the scientific process and the true value of what the process of science brings to us, particularly with respect to health and human wellness. Um, and so it collectively has a large impact on how we deal with things like a pandemic. And so it's, it's something that's very, very important to me and something that I first question. And our first question goes to Dinusha Dietrich. As both a practitioner and a small business owner, you consistently have to balance the needs of your patients with the needs of your business, working collaboratively with multiple sectors of the healthcare industry. How did the pandemic change the way in which you provide patient care and what impacts has it had on your business? First of all, thank you to President Gaitel, Dr. Hochness, and to the brand community for putting together this panel and allowing me to be a part of it. Um, as a little bit of a background, I am a co-owner of a three provider practice in Smithfield. This is my 18th year in practice. And although ours is an independent small practice, we are actually affiliated with a organization called Rhode Island Primary Care Corporation which is a independent practice association. And through them, we are part of the Integra Accountable Care Organization here in Rhode Island. So um, it is uh, a bigger group that we benefit from being a part of. Uh, we also serve as a clinical training site, as you mentioned, for Brown medical students and Bryant PA students. So even before the pandemic, my life was pretty complicated and I wore a lot of hats. Um, the early days of the pandemic, I think we can best describe as controlled panic. 
um, as we became aware that this wasn't just another pandemic scare like MERS or H1N1 or SARS or even Ebola. This was the real deal and it was happening. Um, all of us were really overwhelmed in the uh, pediatric community by the sheer volume of information that was coming at us. Um, it seemed to change by the hour. And we were really desperate for guidance on how to respond and what we really needed to do to take care of ourselves and our patients. Uh, unfortunately, it quickly became really clear uh, that there was not going to be a coordinated plan at the national level. Um, and unlike other countries, it just seemed very fractured and it was not clear who to trust at that level. Um, so we turned to local leadership. Uh, Rhode Island pediatricians luckily, historically, have had a very strong relationship with our local health department. And we felt confident that their guidance would be both um, credible, data-driven, and of practical utility. Uh, in Rhode Island, we also were very fortunate that our governor stepped up very quickly to become the point person for the um, Rhode Island COVID response. And all of the messaging from her was done in coordination with and in alignment with the state health director, state health department director and other health experts um, in the field. So led by this team of um, experts and policymakers, um, the, the state was able to quickly coordinate um, their efforts to um, respond to setting up to state statewide testing and respiratory care centers and to coordinate the difficult decisions that were made about shutting down the state. The governor also made a very crucial decision to mandate that um, health insurance companies in the state cover COVID related care and uh, especially importantly cover telehealth services that were provided via any platform, including by phone, uh, at this, and cover them at the same rates as in-person care. And this will become important. Uh, the reason why this is important will become clear in a few more minutes. Um, in, in addition to our state leaders, our practice also turned to our partners at Rhode Island Primary Care to help us develop best practices and to kind of wade through the swamp of overwhelming information overload that was coming to us. Um, for our practice, our patient, our patient safety was a priority and our staff safety was a priority. I have never been more aware uh, in my 18 years that I'm a small business owner in addition to being a practitioner. And we very quickly had to come up with emergency protocols that would allow us to stay open safely and to maintain our patients' trust in us and our staff's trust in us. Uh, we heard through our uh, colleague Grapevine of practices that really struggled with um, mass cancellations of appointments, as well as staff quitting um, en masse because they did not feel comfortable um, risking their health. Uh, we were lucky in our practice to have more um, protective personal equipment, PPE, than many practices because my infectious disease background meant that I'd actually done Ebola prep uh, when we had that scare. And we'd also been really uh, up to date with having extra supplies on hand from our flu season that we had been, just been through. Uh, during the shutdown, we decided to prioritize care for zero to two-year-olds to make sure we delivered routine vaccinations on schedule and provide support to our most vulnerable um, children and families. We also, uh, despite previous resistance, very quickly adopted telehealth um, because it uh, gave us some capacity to provide sick care and um, as Jennifer is probably gonna to speak to, uh, more importantly, provide mental health and behavioral health support for our families, for which there was uh, in the crisis time and ongoing an unprecedented need for behavioral health and mental health support for our families and children. It was a steep learning curve for us with this uh, new way of delivering care, not only for us, but for our patients. Everything from the technical aspects of it to um, reimbursement, to um, how to do it in a HIPAA compliant safe way. And it really highlighted disparities in patient access to reliable internet and phone services. So it is something that this country is going to need to address. Uh, by April, we had uh, reasonable confidence our protocols were working. So we began to open up to more ages for routine well care. 
and some very limited in-person sick care, but we still had severe limitations on the volume of patients we could see per day due to our need for new check-in procedures and new cleaning protocols. So we were starting to feel significant financial impact of these decreased volume. And we had real concerns about our ability to meet payroll and meet our overhead expenses. Right around this time, the federal government did try to provide some support to small business owners and our practice was able to secure a paycheck loan. But that money was a very temporary fix and it only went so far. Um, at this time, historical and longstanding issues with subpar reimbursement for pediatric care in Rhode Island meant that most of us were uh, barely breaking even, even before the pandemic and several pediatric practices actually closed during the shutdown. We really needed more help to stay viable, not only for our own practice, but from our colleagues and all of us in Rhode Island that were in pediatric practice. Luckily, a uh, lot of advocacy by the Rhode Island chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics Practice organizations like Rhode Island Primary Care, uh, local providers. Uh, we partnered with leaders at the state health department, with the state Medicaid office, and with the uh, Rhode Island Executive Office of Health and Human Services. And uh, there's a newly created Pediatric Governors uh, Advisory Council in Rhode Island now. And all of those leadership, uh, all those leaders and stakeholders partnered with the insurance payers, and we're all starting to actually work together finally to support um, pediatric practices, both financially and by facilitating access to testing, to resources, to PPE and other support. Um, so there has been a big shift. Um, and this is, comes at a really crucial time as we move from crisis management to our new normal. Uh, and especially as we prepare to deal with the impact of children going back to school, of us entering our first flu season uh, and facing whether COVID vaccine will be available, safe and accessible to all, and whether there will be good uptake uh, due to significant concerns in this country about vaccines, uh, warranted or unwarranted, uh, you know, we'll, we'll leave to others to discuss, but certainly uh, even with vaccines being available, accessible and safe, whether enough people will take it to um, create uh, protection for enough of the population for us to go back to some semblance of normality. Um, so I guess I'll just summarize by saying uh, clearly just as no man is an island, no practice can function in isolation. And if anything comes good out of this, if anything good comes out of this pandemic, it'll be the realization that the stakeholders at all levels need to work together to ensure the availability of good quality pediatric and adult medical care in Rhode Island. Thank you. So as Dr. Dietrich sort of highlighted this idea that not only are practitioners trying to manage patients in a really high anxiety environment, you're also dealing with the struggles of how to keep a business open and how do you, how do you perform those functions and highlighted the need for really true leadership um, for crosstalk between other sectors such as, you know, insurance companies, government agencies, so on and so forth. The other thing the pandemic has really highlighted is the fact that we didn't know anything about this virus. So all of this information was coming out in real time. And so so my next question is for Jay, in that as all of this information is coming out in real time, how did that impact your ability as a practitioner working on the front lines? Um, how did that impact your ability to take care of your patients, to manage your patients, to manage your patients' anxieties? And how did you have to work collaboratively to be able to overcome some of those issues? You're on mute, Jay. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Ross, uh, to President Gattel, and to Provost Macy, and to you, Kirsten, and for the team that put this together. This is a great opportunity to talk about the challenges that we faced uh, within, within this outbreak and since COVID began. Um, so to answer your question, I was, uh, I was very fortunate in a lot of ways, but also, you know, to come into this pandemic at the very beginning. I work at a uh, health center, a community health center in Chelsea, Massachusetts, affiliated with Mass General Hospital. And Chelsea was one of the hottest areas for the viral outbreak at the beginning of this pandemic, especially in Massachusetts. Um, so the very first shift that I showed up for, I can tell you that honestly, we knew almost nothing. Um, and as you said, information was coming at us like so fast. And so at first you were taking information from public resources, from federal resources, 
from just about anyone who was feeding in information. And normally you talked about the scientific process and normally the scientific process is vetted. So people will do research and it will be peer reviewed and it'll be published in a journal and then it'll eventually come down to affect us. We were making decisions with things that had not been peer reviewed, that had been talked about, that had been tried. And we were dealing with patients who honestly came in sicker than we expected. And we were seeing radiographs with this bizarre pattern of pneumonia that we just had not seen before. And it took me back to coming into healthcare during the HIV crisis and the same type of things. When we were first seeing pneumocystis pneumonia, we were like, why are these people sick? Why do they look like this? And all of a sudden it was the same type of thing. We had so we had 20 year olds, we had 40 year olds, we had 60 year olds, and they all had this bizarre presentation and we didn't know what to do. We'd admit them to the hospital and they were trying anticoagulation. They were trying antibiotics. We were taking from the federal stage where we were starting people on hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, vitamins. And, and honestly, I would go home from a shift physically exhausted, mentally exhausted. I just, I just would leave and I'd be like, what did we do today? And so you would go home and try to rethink. And when you would go back literally four days later, everything that you thought you knew four days ago was now a new set of information. We're gonna try this, we're gonna be doing this. We're gonna open this, this, this respiratory care clinic. We're gonna shut down every other clinic in our building and we're gonna take over a building and change into a respiratory care clinic. We were wearing face masks. We weren't wearing N95s, we were wearing simple face masks. We were told this was gonna be where, okay we were unsure of how the virus was potentially transmitted. So we would go in and we thought this is, this is how this is coming about. And then it finally started to be, we're at, we're at Mass General. We, you know, we claim to be, you know, one of the best hospitals in the world, the best scientists. And we would have these town halls of infectious disease, internal medicine, pediatrics, family medicine, the whole hospitalist team, and I've never seen the amount of, of, of passion in those rooms. People who are like, what can we do? We have to figure this out. We have to get better. And people would sit there and go, ask these questions. And it seemed like so simple. Like, should we be doing this? Why are we not trying this? Everyone wanted to give the best they could. Everyone was trying to figure out the best practices. But then you would go home and you would talk to your family or God forbid you would turn on a news channel or, or I just, I had to turn off the internet. I mean, honestly, the amount of misinformation was flooding into the, into the people's homes so quickly, almost more quickly than we were getting real medical information we were getting, and this was influencing not only, you would think this was influencing the general public, this was influencing medical decision making. And so we were sitting there listening to the news or reading articles or pulling down this information. And it just became, again, a world of where is the scientific process? It was falling behind the decision making. And so that, that really, I think it weighed heavily. The other thing is that you would go into clinic and all you saw were COVID patients. Now you got to remember, and, and I think uh, Dr. Dietrich said this very well, you were used to having all of your patients coming in. They still had their high blood pressure, their diabetes, their stroke care, their heart failure, but they were deathly afraid to come in. We, we would not get the phone calls from these people until we were telling them, look, you've got to call 911 and go into the hospital. The, the, it was, they were waiting until such the end of, of this. And so this, this, this problem was inherent where we had legitimate fear, we had misinformation, and we had a public who was either this virus doesn't exist or this virus is going to kill me. And it was like you were fighting that every single day. And thank, I mean, I really look so wonderfully upon, uh, as Dr. Dietrich said, Did you guys lose Jay? 
I think we lost Jay. Apparently he said my name was sweet and was then speechless. All right, well, we, we can wait for Jay and he can finish his comments. Um, so according to what Jay was talking about, this idea of misinformation, and I think one of the things that's really, really pivotal as we move forward in the age of this coming vaccine, which will hopefully be our savior, is that we're dealing with a general public that doesn't really have a strong um, health literacy, right? And so we're expecting people to make decisions when there's so much information and how do you process information? Um, and again, this is something that's pretty close to, to my research line as well in that I just, we just published a, a, a publication with the communication department looking just specifically at vaccine hesitancy and how individuals make decisions based on vaccines and how the communication realm is going to be able to help us to weed through a lot of this misinformation. Um, so Jay, did you want to just finish your last comment? before I turn it over to Major Coleman. Sure, and sorry, my, my web just completely dropped out. And so, you know, I, I was essentially saying that, that finally within the last month or two, we've gotten solid guidance coming down. And I think we're now all moving into a good position to start providing healthcare the best we can. The, we're, we're at a point where we now understand enough about this virus to, uh, to start moving together in a coordinated effort. And that's been because we've worked in such a collaborative way with scientists, with physicians, with researchers, and right down to our nursing staff, to our, to our allied health staff. It's just been this, this team effort to go into work and make it, a, and make it better for every patient who walks in the door. So again, as we sort of weed through all of this unprecedented information and these times that we're, we're, we're not really sure where we're going, um, the, the levels of anxiety and fear are really at, a, at an all-time high. And so my next question is for Major Coleman. In this global health crisis that's ever-changing and unfolding in real time, what have you seen as some of the biggest effects on the well-being of the population? And do you see any potential long-term effects that this pandemic will have on our population? Thank you. Those are fantastic. Fantastic questions, um, Kirsten. And I think really since COVID hit, we have seen on a national and an international level just rates of anxiety, depression, and stress just skyrocket. And I think there's some broad reasons why we're seeing those rates increase. And so first, I want to talk about the health-related anxiety. As COVID is a new disease, and we're really our understanding of this disease is evolving if hourly, daily, weekly. And I think as you've talked about some of the misinformation, Jay, um, and just in general, because how we understand this disease has shifted on so many levels and so often, that's creating a lot of angst for families. And so we don't understand what's going on. Um, people are wondering, am I going to be safe? Are my loved ones going to be safe? Um, our healthcare workers I want to give a shout out. The, bird, the burnout that we're seeing with our healthcare personnel is also unprecedented. And I think that there's a variety of reasons for that as well. Access to PPE, right, our personal protective equipment. Um, one of my very close friends who is a nurse in New York City um, was using the same N95 mask for a month and every single one of her patients was a COVID patient. Right. So feeling unsafe, healthcare workers being separated from their families because they're having um, contact with COVID-19 patients. And so I think the health related anxiety is very legitimate and very valid. And so because we don't fully understand this disease and our understanding is evolving, that's contributing to a lot of anxiety. And then I think the second broad category is kind of job related and economic, right? So COVID-19 has really highlighted the economic disparity in this country when it comes to access to resources. Jobs are lower class and disadvantaged folks continue to be even more disadvantaged in terms of job loss and being able to support their family. Um, our individuals who do have jobs who are maybe expected to work from home and full-time parent and still do both of those things very well, that is, con that is contributing to a significant amount of stress in our household. And that kind of goes to, I think, our third realm, which is kind of the interpersonal realm, right? So because there's financial stress, there's a job stress, and now really most relevant for many families is the idea of at-home schooling in which states and communities within each state have very different ideas of how children should be returning back to school. That encompasses a whole host of issues that contribute to stress, safety of children, 
safety of school teachers? How am I going to help my child learn while also working? Do I lose my job? Is my work flexible? How am I going to pay bills? We see an unprecedented amount of stress that we have on families as a result of COVID-19 and both the local, state, and federal um, laws and policies that are being enacted because of this global pandemic, right, to try to keep people safe. We're also seeing higher rates of domestic violence as well. What I'm seeing kind of on my end and aren't used to living with that person, are not used to parenting their children and working at the same time. Um, we're seeing rates of domestic violence skyrocket. And we see that through um, looking at kind of our national police data. And so how do we provide resources for individuals who are at risk? We already had limited resources to begin with to provide for individuals who were in domestically violent relationships. And we're seeing that our access to resources is being taxed. In this country, we already had limited um, ability to provide appropriate mental health care for our communities. And with all of the stress that COVID-19 is placing on our communities, that system is being taxed even more, especially with being able to provide telehealth mental services. And so one of the biggest um, areas I see in terms of the impact is how we provide mental health resources. Not all practices or clinics were providing telehealth resources. And I think one of the positive things that can come from COVID-19 is actually being able to use telehealth resources to access communities who might not be able to get to a clinic in person and being able to assess and treat and help individuals via phone or via um, virtual means. And so I think we actually might be able to learn to be able to reach those harder to reach communities. Um, yeah, I just think COVID-19 has really placed a significant undue burden on our families, on our individuals. And so we're figuring out as a community, how can we best help as mental health professionals? Not to be all doom and gloom though, right? Gloom and doom. I think that one of the things that COVID-19 has highlighted for us is that despite all of our technological advances, one of the reasons why we're stressed is because we're not able to see our family members and to see those who we love the most, despite having all this technology. And what that says to us and to the mental health community is that connection and personal connection is exceptionally important. And maybe this might be an opportunity for folks to take a step back, really take stock of what's important and to have a hobby, to connect with loved ones, right? And to really evaluate their values. And so I think one of the good things that can come from COVID-19 is a reevaluation of our relationships with others. Cool, thank you. Um, so I know that um, just to get to our last panelist here, one of the, the big questions and concerns that all of us here on this call have is dealing with vaccine hesitancy. Um, we're all sort of waiting for this magical vaccine and all of the things that have happened in the past six months that have really heightened anxiety, mistrust, um, some of the sort of more negative impacts of this pandemic are driving rates of hesitancy to, to sort of go through the roof. And it's something that we're very, very afraid of. Um, and so my next question and last question goes to Dr. Zerur. Um, as a scientist and entrepreneur who's the founder and CEO of a company that is contributing to the development and manufacturing of a potential COVID vaccine, can you speak briefly to where we are with respect to the vaccine development and also with respect to your industry, how important it is to have collaboration between scientists and scientists that understand the business of, of the sector? Absolutely. Thanks, Kirsten. And, and I want to say thanks to Major Coleman. Uh, thanks for your service. And, and thank you, obviously, for focusing on mental health, which is one of the biggest issues that comes out of things like this. Um, My pleasure. So, I mean, to answer the question is we will have a vaccine. Uh, we're very fortunate, and I know it sounds crazy to say that we're lucky, but we are lucky that this was a coronavirus-driven vaccine uh, during the pandemic and not something caused by say an influenza virus or some other kind of retrovirus which would be susceptible to significantly higher rates of mutation and would make the development of a vaccine in nine months almost impossible. 
So we are fortunate. There is a silver lining here, which is this, this is a relatively simple virus, right? As, as, as far as viruses go, this is from its genomic construct, relatively simple. I agree with Jay, this thing causes things in humans that we just are only beginning to understand uh, from neurological to cardiovascular to obviously respiratory problems that we never imagined. But from the perspective of understanding the biology of this virus, it is actually a very simple virus. And so we will have a vaccine and we will likely have a vaccine that is deemed to be safe first and foremost, and then somewhat effective by the end of this year. I'm pretty certain that we will have the approval of at least one vaccine by the end of this year. The next series of questions are the really important questions. I think the first question is how effective is this going to be? And I think the bar that the different regulatory authorities around the world have placed is a relatively modest bar, which is about 50% efficacious, meaning that if you give it to 100 people, those 100 people are exposed to the virus, at least 50 of them will be protected from the virus. And that doesn't mean that they won't get the infection. It just means that their symptoms will be dramatically better than if they didn't have the vaccine. Uh, over time, that will improve. Over time, while keeping the safety of the vaccine, the, the pharmaceutical and research uh, bodies will try to improve on the efficacy. But I think for frontline workers having something that will protect them from getting seriously sick is going to be a really important first step. And we will have that by the end of this year. So the second question is, when will the rest of us get it, right? And, and I think that's uh, if we are trying to figure out a way to rebuild from this horrible situation that we are in, which is horrible. It is pretty bad in the United States. And as you start going outside of the United States, it is really horrible and desperate. Um, in order to start rebuilding on that normality globally, we don't need just to vaccinate 300 million Americans. We're going to need 7.7 .7 billion doses of this vaccine. And most likely than not, we're going to need 7.7 .7 billion doses every year because a we have no idea how much uh how much the immunity to the virus will last when conferred by a vaccine the estimates that we have aren't great suggest somewhere between six months to a year which means that we would need to get a boost every year for the time being and number two we don't know when millions of people are infected even with a simple virus as coronavirus there will be some rate of mutation and so we will be in a situation where at least for the next four to five years, a vaccine that is effective at a global scale needs to be able to be produced anew every year and with sufficient scale to, to distribute among seven and a half billion people. That's where the real big challenge in coordination has to come in. Now, if we look at what, ha what has happened so far, I, I agree uh, with Dr. Uh, Dietrich, there's, there's been no coordination at the federal level Imagine at the global level, right? We're sitting here, every country is doing something different. Uh, you know, the WHO is kind of sitting there going like, what are we doing? And the US is taking the funding away. So how are we gonna pay our employees? So it's going to be a real mess and it's gonna have to be driven. And, and I hate to say this, but it is going to have to be driven by the pharmaceutical companies. And the pharmaceutical companies are gonna have to come together and realize that it is going to be our responsibility, not our right, to make money out of a COVID situation. It's going to be our responsibility as pharmaceutical executives to come up with a way to get this vaccine at an appropriate cost to everybody in the planet. Now, what we decided to do is we basically dropped every other healthcare program that we had in our, in our pipeline. We had programs going to flu, sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, Fabris, et cetera. They are all on pause. And we threw everybody that we have into figuring out how to make seven and a half billion doses of COVID vaccine. I think efforts like that need to happen across the board and need to be coordinated globally to make sure that we can deliver this vaccine that is going to be safe and, and over time more and more efficacious to every person on the planet. Only then can we really start saying, okay, let's rebuild. How do we deal with, and, and luckily, and this is really fortunate, this is a very localized US problem. Right? If you go to Mexico, you go to India, you go to Brazil, 95 plus percent of the people say, give me that vaccine today, tomorrow, I'll get, you know. Now, this problem that we have where a third of our population thinks that the COVID vaccine is going to, you know, give them autism or, or, or some, you know, whatever diabolical, whatever nonsense is being spoken these days, uh, you know, it is very localized. And I think that that is, you know, that is fortunate. We may see outbreaks of COVID even with a vaccine in the United States 
driven by this fear, unfounded fear of vaccines. But I think that globally we'll get uh, we'll get the penetration that we need should this vaccine be available. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to remind everyone that you can use the chat function to submit your questions and we'll make sure that the panelists um, will answer those questions for you in real time. Um, I do have a couple of questions from students that have come through um, and I'll try to direct them, but you guys can also jump in as you see fit. Um, the first one comes from Mitchell Doucette, who is an accounting major taking biology. Um, and his question is, how do you see telehealth shaping the future of the healthcare field? And do you think it's working well right now? So I don't know if Danusha or Jay, if you guys want to step in first. Sure. So I think that um, it's going to pretty significantly change the landscape of how we practice. Um, it's probably going to affect people's decisions about entering the healthcare field too. And it has certainly already had an impact on training of our future um, healthcare practitioners. Uh, Jay knows personally that a lot of practices just said no thanks to students for a good, good while uh, because we just were so overwhelmed and we couldn't really handle uh, and we weren't even sure it was safe to have you know, more bodies in the office. Um, our practice um, has reopened to students, so we've been, uh, you know, trying to keep that as uh, something important for us to do. But many practices and um, Brown Medical students basically shut down, were pulled off all clinical rotations, uh, many people's lives being affected by this. So there's going to be a, a gap in training for many people. Uh, in terms of healthcare landscape, I think um, ongoing conversations about health disparities that have been highlighted by this pandemic are gonna to need to happen in this country and around the world. I think access to mental behavioral health um, is a huge piece of this, as well as our um, country's infrastructure for um, you know, access to uh, good reliable internet, good, uh, you know, good access to even just having a phone uh, there are many patients who are and families who have had so much financial impact of this uh, pandemic that you know we can't even provide care because they can't get to us. They don't have a car. They don't have. They can't pay their phone bill. They can't, you know, have childcare. So they're you know they're they're being impacted at work on every level. So uh, I think this is going to be a transformative event for this country and for the world. And uh, hopefully we can all step up, do our part. Um, and figure this out together. I think that uh, the other thing that it's been a, a big piece of it is realizing that there's an aging provider infrastructure in this country too, uh, especially in Rhode Island. Two thirds of pediatricians are um, over, over 50 in this state and there's only 140 of us. So many people choosing early retirement uh, just don't wanna deal with it or feel that they're at risk. Uh, so that's gonna be a problem too. So if there's nobody coming in and we're all aging out that's gonna be a real problem too. So uh, many, many impacts on many levels. Great, and I have a, another question from a student, Cicero, who's a biology student. And Jay, maybe you can take this one. With the flu season coming up, do you think this will affect the number of cases of COVID or will it stay the same? So probably one of the most complicating things we see is that flu and uh, COVID-19 along with strep throat present almost identical symptoms. And so the complicating factor for campuses, for congregate living areas, is that when somebody comes in and says, I have fever, chills, and body aches, you've now got three disease processes that you have to work between. Um, so that causes a lot of distress. Now, there is some good news coming out of the Southern Hemisphere, and that's that because of physical distancing and mask wearing, the, influen the influenza numbers have been lower. Um, and hopefully with the continued aspects of protecting ourselves from COVID on this campus and across the state and the country, we'll see lower numbers of influenza. The transmission is very similar with droplet borne transmission. And so with masks, with physical distancing, with better hand washing, we're gonna see much lower rates of influenza transmission. I can't stress enough how important getting the influenza vaccine will be this year, um, because if we can lower the chances of somebody having influenza and, and that then when somebody does come in sick, 
if we if we have to treat all these people as, as if they're COVID, that means we will run out of quarantine space very, very quickly. And that's across states, across hospitals, across ICUs, and across other healthcare settings. So it'll be a critical for this year to, for us to look out for that. Yeah, and, and, add, and adding to that, I, you know, putting the immunologist hat on, one of the things that, that, uh, that remains after the active viral infection goes on COVID is this heightened alert state of our immune system that leads to generalized inflammation. If you contract influenza when you are in that state, that can lead to really severe complications. So I, I can't emphasize enough what Jay just said. Get that flu vaccine, get it now. Uh, certainly those of us who have little kids who are still going to school, you know, get them that flu shot before they go back to school. Yeah, I want to um, emphasize that from a pediatric perspective, we really want really tremendous uptake more than usual um, for pediatric patients getting their flu vaccine, especially as they're starting to re-enter school in person. We did see a significant drop in just routine illness uh, in children, which really makes us all laugh on like, it really does matter to wash your hands, guys, and not cough on each other. So um, it was quite remarkable what the drop in regular illness was, but now we're starting to see it pick up again as they kind of get back in contact with each other and people are getting a little more lax on mask wearing and social distancing, unfortunately, as we are entering month six. So emphasizing both vaccination and hand hygiene and uh, cough control, uh, mask wearing is really important. I'm gonna, that, that's a good segue because I have, a, I have a, a couple questions that are all kind of related, so I'll try to put them together. Um, so one of them is coming in about um, the fallout from deferred health care and some of the issues with respect to, I know we talked about this earlier, um, you know, missed immunization, schools not going back, so children not being forced to vaccinate. Um, and so what are the fallouts that we expect to have from that? And then secondarily, how are we going to go about in the U.S. and in the Bryant College, or the Bryant, someone wrote Bryant College, uh, Bryant University community with respect to how are we going to encourage people despite these anxieties and fears to actually get vaccinated. Um, so I don't know, Danusha, if you want to start with the deferred and then we can talk about the communication perhaps. Sure. So um, traditionally in Rhode Island, it, we are number one in the country in terms of our vaccine coverage rates for children. Um, and we're very proud of that. And that is with uh, strong partnerships with the health department. This is a vaccine purchase state, uh, universal purchase state. The vac state provides vaccines to all pediatric providers so that we can distribute it with at no cost to our own practices up front. Uh, it's made a huge impact on vaccine rates in this uh, state, but nationwide in a very short span of time, um, even in Rhode Island, rates dropped to 67% from over 90% in two months. I mean, it, it was just, terrifying actually for those of us in the field. And uh, that was actually part of the uh, data that drove uh, uh, Gina Raimondo to really pull together um, resources to support us opening and being safe because that happened so fast. Uh, and we had to reestablish trust with our patients and um, with access to care as well. And so um, it, it basically was something that was mirrored across the country in terms of very rapid declines in vaccination rates and probably even more dramatic in other parts of the country that did not have as good vaccine rates as we did to begin with. So it's gonna be a build back uh, you know, moment where we are all frantically reopening, trying to get back our patients uh, in, in to see us when we have less capacity less PPE and less, um, less comfort that uh, any child, especially as uh, doctors as Zer uh, can speak to, there's a lot of asymptomatic COVID um, and children are the best carriers um, out there. So uh, we have to treat every patient as a potential COVID case or COVID infected. So, you know, we also need, we have supply chain issues with um, maintaining enough supplies to see patients safely. Adrian Coleman, perhaps you want to talk about maybe how we can encourage people to get vaccinated despite anxieties and fears? That's a terrific question, and I don't think I have a, fant a fantastic answer, right? We know from the research that simply educating folks about the dangers of uh, doing particular behaviors does not at all reduce, right, problem behaviors. We see this with smoking campaigns, alcohol, right? Um, we just know that, it, that we have to get at the emotion. And I think right now 
one of the major problems we have is that I think people are going to be scared about what are the long-term effects of the vaccine, right? We're talking about a population. If you asked people on the street, why would most people know how a vaccine works? They just know they're supposed to get their vaccine and it's supposed to make you feel, you're not supposed to get the flu. That's what most people think, right? They think that they're not going to get a disease if they get the vaccine, but we know as healthcare providers, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get the flu. What it means is that you can contract it, but your symptoms are going to be less. Most people aren't aware that that's how a vaccine works. And so I think people are going to be very, very scared. And so as healthcare providers, as primary care physicians in particular, and nurses on the front lines, how we talk to patients about getting a vaccine matters. And so I go back to, for those of you who are interested in psychology, motivational interviewing from a primary care perspective is highly effective. What is motivational interviewing? We're basically getting at people's values, what is important to them. What's important to people is protecting themselves and protecting their family and acknowledging that we don't know everything about this vaccine and we don't know everything about this disease. But what we can talk to them about is how can we best protect your family with the information that we have at hand, here's how we can do that. And working through with patients um, what their concerns are, right? And what are the cost benefits of getting the vaccine and not getting the vaccine and having the patient come to the conclusion that a vaccine would be best. But we, we're not very good at persuading individuals to get vaccines or to make behavior change. It's very difficult to change behavior. It's very difficult to get at that fear, especially when that fear, there's still so many unknowns with COVID. We don't know COVID the way that we know about other things that we get vaccinated for. And so I think that's going to be the biggest challenge in working with patients and families and individuals with this vaccine is that we can't pretend to know more information than we have currently. And so my biggest um, recommendation as healthcare providers is talking with, talking with people about how they are feeling getting at what are they scared about and getting at how can we make the best decision for you and your family. We know that jamming it down people's throats does not help. As a matter of fact, we have a writing reflex, right? When we say that you must do this, we're going to have the writing reflex. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Right? So I think being really respectful of people's autonomy and their choice and also talking through with them, the best choices for them and their family is going to be the best way forward. I, I think it's worth noting too that that's that's the exact answer. People don't aren't motivated by that, and that's one of the reasons that this, this disease doesn't scare many people. And I think Dr. Zarr said it very truly that, you know, we are looking at death rates very closely almost every day, but the long-term effects of this virus are going to be significant. And, um, and so we need to watch that. And then to Dr. Dietrich's point, um, the training in medical education has changed so much and it has driven a fear of people going into the healthcare uh, community. And we've essentially told our 65 plus year old healthcare providers that you know they're at a higher risk of, of, of attaining and having complications of this virus. And many have chosen to retire early. Um, so our healthcare system in general is going to feel the effects of this virus along with the people themselves. All right, so for interest of time, I have one more question from our chat box and then one more question for all of you just to sort of wrap things up. So the last question from the chat box, what do you believe healthcare providers can do to alleviate disparity in access to the vaccine when it becomes available, especially in undersourced communities? Who wants to jump at that? We gotta make it, we gotta make it cheap. We gotta make it really inexpensive. We have to figure out a way to pull together resources for manufacturing so that the cost of producing the vaccine is really around, you know, let's say a dollar to three dollars per dose. Um, I think that you guys have all heard in the news over the last several weeks, people saying, well, this is gonna be a 50 to hundred dollar type solution, and that's just not gonna work. We 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 have as, as a country and as a pharmaceutical industry and as a healthcare industry, the obligation to pull the resources together to make this accessible to everybody. There's, there's no 
there's no other answer here. And I know that, you know, <laughs> coming up with, with a hyper capitalistic market driven uh, answer in front of the president of the university, who's an economist is probably not the right thing to say, but we got to be really socialist about this vaccine. It, this is a public service that we, the, that our industry is obligated to provide. Uh, this is not a revenue opportunity. I also want to mention that it, this really speaks to um, in, improving our country's healthcare infrastructure, public health infrastructure too. Uh, states that do not have universal purchase of vaccines are going to really struggle with um, putting burden on individual provider practices to purchase vaccine and distribute it. Um, that's not something most small practices can handle right now. We're already skating on the thin edge of, you know, uh, financial solvency at the moment. So it is very comforting to me to live in a state that does uh, have a good uh, public health department that is supported by the, um, you know, local politicians uh, and understanding uh, what the importance of supporting the health department and listening to the health department and partnering with local, uh, local practices are, um, but that's going to be so disparate in different parts of the country. We need to have some kind of national coming together on um, providing this. It's so, you know, socialism is a dirty word, but I, I think it's just in terms of social good, um, it, you know, might be the better way to think about it. it. It is not just about one state, one country. This is a global issue and we need to really kind of think like that. But I'll step in and, and, and back up uh, President Gattel here and, and the capitalist model to a small degree. Um, we, do have to, we do have to have an adequate supply chain because in the end, how we usually do this when something like this comes up is as everyone goes all hands on deck to fix the point of produce it, mass producing COVID vaccine, we will have to scale back on production of influenza vaccine and other things. And there's only so many eggs in the supply chain. There's only so many. This. We also have to fix that infrastructure problem. And it'll involve a lot more than just pharma, the pharma industry getting involved. It'll be, you know, all of our supply chains need to be corrected to make this happen. And you can see this in the COVID testing market. You know, we're extremely fortunate at Bryant to have engaged early in both a point of care test and in testing with a lab that's capable of testing. But you can see that labs have not been able to spool up over six months to provide adequate testing. And we're looking at a supply chain to do the same thing for vaccinations. Reed, I think the, the pharmaceutical efforts are a necessary evil, but by no means sufficient evil. Yeah. The, the good news, of course, is that none of the COVID vaccines that are going to make it through the finish line are modalities that will take away from, say, the flu vaccine or the traditional vaccines. These are new technologies. And that's actually part of the problem, that because they're so new, we don't have the infrastructure to produce them. We're having to build the factories to produce the vaccines with this new technology. I think that's a good thing. And Dr. Dietrich, I, you know, I agree with you. We, we need better coordination at the national level for vaccine procurement, not only vaccine, but all, all fundamental medicines that, that our pediatric population needs. I think in this case, the fact that we have some states that don't have the purchasing power is actually gonna help drive the cost down. Because you know there are states that are simply not going to be able to afford it. And the pharmaceutical companies are gonna to have to sacrifice their margins uh, in order to make it work. And that's actually a good thing in this case. I think we, go ahead. I think we see the connection though with with our with having to be so focused on COVID-19. What I'm seeing um, as a second and third order effect is that a lot of um, patients who I've seen who are not concerned about COVID but have other health related concerns, they're having significant delays in getting their lab and test results getting to them as well. And so I, I think we're just seeing how everything is interconnected because people need to have their diabetes, you know, testing come back, right? Their cardiology results. And what we're seeing is that labs cannot keep up with all the testing for COVID and all the testing for every other, any other health related condition that's not COVID related. And so we just see, again, that continued impact. We have to focus on COVID-19, but the, the effects on other health-related conditions, including mental health, just continue. So as we, we need to have an infrastructure available to, to be able to provide, you know, these lab results. And we just simply don't have that in our, in our current economy and current system. 
So that kind of goes to our very last question, which comes from one of our students. She's a bio student, Colby Dizio. And if you guys each want to just really quickly in a sentence or two comment on this. But our question was, how can we become better prepared for the next viral outbreak, given what we're learning from this one? So if we want to start, maybe Jennifer, you want to start? How can we prepare for the next viral outbreak? I think we're still working on being prepared for this viral outbreak. I don't think we mastered it, right? Um, we, are not, we are not built to have a disaster mental health response at all times, right? And so I think that's difficult. From a mental health perspective, I think already practicing proper things like self-care, financials, right? We know that trying to be financially prepared, purchasing items within your means, one of the biggest indicator, one of the biggest factors contributing to stress is financial. Um, and so for families, right, where can you cut, right? Where can you cut out things that you don't need? Where can you start saving? Where can you start saving money? Are we already engaging in healthy practices like eating well, exercising, right? We know that the country doesn't do that well because of the disease pathologies that we see, right, with obesity, cardiac issues, right? Can we begin to engage in healthier practices with things that we can control with diet and exercise? And also, I would say connecting with our family, right? I think COVID-19 has really highlighted for us um, that we need to be connected to our loved ones. And so maybe reaching out more often to those requesting help when we need it. And so I think already just engaging in those healthy practices will help us prepare as much as possible for the next disaster. But let me be clear, we are still not prepared and still actively working within this current pandemic. Jay, final thought? Sure. So I think that we've already touched on this a lot. And I think that we don't need to prepare for the next pandemic. We need to prepare for ongoing pandemics. We need to prepare for this as a future. We need our infrastructure fixed. We need our communications fixed. We need our mental health fixed. We just need much better coordination of efforts across our public health spectrum is really what it is. It's, 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 it's going to be every single time, you know, we have fallen behind on influenza. We've had measles outbreaks. This, this is not just the, the pandemic. It's one example of the lack of infrastructure fixes within our healthcare system. Tanusha, how about you? I think just following up on that, I think this is just a watershed moment uh, in so many ways for this country. Um, in the middle of a pandemic, the Black Lives Movement, um, an election coming up, you know, we have to decide who we are as a country, who we are as a people, where we want to be in the world. Um, and as I said, we have to get outside ourselves a little bit too and see, uh, you know, what can you do? Can you turn and help a neighbor? Can you can you check in with the uh, you know, old lady on the street who may not have access to food. You know, we, we need to get back to some sense of community. Um, we need to fix our healthcare system in so many ways. I think it's just become really obvious how broken it is. And we need to kind of really be advocates um, as practitioners, be advocates. We have to get out there, get outside of our little boxes, uh, start working at public health policy. We start, you know, uh, talking to our legislators and start educating and informing people that they need to also be advocates for their own health and their own family's needs. Um, we need everybody to kind of have a voice in this. And we need to listen. Uh, we need to really understand what people need and we need to figure out how to provide that while at the same time meeting the needs of our staff, our businesses uh, and our own mental health because I can tell you that for myself, um, it has been exhausting uh, both physically and mentally and a burden on my family too, to kind of be there to support me as I kind of try to support them through all of this. I've got one child in college. Uh, I've got one child at home trying to do distance learning and, uh, and a husband who's also trying to figure out how to be a good professor and teacher and mentor and department chair. You know, there's a lot of pressure on families and practitioners too. And we have to remember that we're also human and we're also completely affected by this. So I think preparing better for um, mental health care for ourselves as well as our families is key. And then redeveloping a sense of community and then taking a good look at our um, public health infrastructure and our policy making at all levels to make sure that we don't put ourselves in such a disastrous situation in the future. 
So I have a kind of a different view of, of, of things. I think that if you look at what's going on right now and why uh, the U.S. is faring so much worse than anybody else, and make no mistake, we are the worst in the world, no, period, no, no question asked. Uh, it's because we have a war in this country going on against science. I don't know who decided to make science a political item, but it is, and, and, and we can't deny it, right? There's war on the fact that the planet is warming. There's war on whether face masks are effective or not. There is war on whether a vaccine is going to cause autism or not. That is not based on any kind of scientific finding whatsoever. We need to restore the public's confidence in science. I think the way in which you prepare for the next pandemic is by letting people understand that science is their friend and not their enemy. And that is a campaign that we educators, I happen to teach as well as I think most of you do, um, you know, have, have a burden. We have to inspire more young people to come into STEM. We have to work diligently to make sure that when they come into STEM, we treat them equally and fairly and in an inclusive manner, right? And for our students who are in the panel, don't bully the nerd, okay? It's really important that we have people who are strongly dedicated to science and the education of science. I think that for as long as in this country we continue to, you know, go into war against science, we will not be prepared for any of these emergencies. And we're facing multiple of those. I, I saw one of the questions from a student come by saying, what are we not doing because we're so focused on COVID? And, and I think she was, you know, she was talking about what other areas of human health care are we not paying attention, cancer and, and whatnot. Yeah, we are. We are kind of neglecting some other things. But just think outside of medicine, the things that we're neglecting because we're so focused on COVID right now. We're neglecting climate change and we're seeing the impact of that in California. We're neglecting the, uh, the systematic extermination of pollinating insects in our fields, which is going to cause a food crisis in this country and around the world. We are not focused on science as a means, as a tool for, advance, for advancement as humanity. We have politicized science and we need to press a rewind bond on that. And the good news is that everybody here can do something about that, right? This is not something that some secretary sitting in Washington has to do. This is something that we as a society need to take as our own objective and, and, and advance science. That's the only way that we can come together to face a, a, a situation, a crisis situation that only has a series of scientific uh, solutions. Yes, there's a number of uh, societal solutions that need to put in place so that the scientific solution can work, but the solution itself has to be based on science. The social distancing, the hygienic measures, the protective, the personal protection, and eventually a vaccine or a treatment. Those are all technology solutions that we have to embrace as, as a society. 100% agree with that, and um, and I hope that we will end up on the right side of history on this one. Thank you. Great. So just to conclude, um, I think we've seen the importance of collaboration across multiple sectors in dealing not only with the pandemic, but in the health and wellness of the global population. We've seen the importance of leadership and the importance of communication, the importance of science and the process of science. Um, we have seen that we are going to have to deal with some long term impacts in terms of the wellness of our population. Um, we're going to have to deal with some of the fractures in our healthcare system with respect to um, disparities across healthcare and the access to healthcare. Um, and so I hope that for my students that are still on here, um, that you can see that, that no matter what field you're interested in, whether or not it's accounting or mathematics or biology, um, there's a role for you in, in becoming some of the next leaders that can change the face of the healthcare, not just in the United States, but globally. So I want to truly thank as a heartfelt thanks to all of our distinguished panelists today, Jennifer Coleman, Danusha Dietrich, Andrew Zurer, and Jay Amrion. I know you guys are all phenomenally busy fighting this global pandemic. So I really thank you for your time and your input for this panel. Um, thanks also to our new president, Ross Gattel, who joined Bryant in July in one of the most challenging times in the institution's history. So we're glad you're here at Bryant to support events like these and hopefully the future of, of more health at, at Bryant. Um, and thank you so much for opening up our panel today.
And lastly, thank you to all who attended this important event, including all of our distinguished um, leaders in the institution, our students, our faculty, our staff. Thank you to everyone who will help to make this panel uh, come to fruition. Um, Eddie for helping to, to set this thing up. And just a reminder that the next panel, this is a series of panels, so the next panel is Restoring the Social Fabric Opportunities and Challenges will be um, will be held October 7th, 2020 at three o'clock. Um, and so make sure you go ahead and register for the next panel as well. So thank you all for coming.